All right, let's go ahead and get started. This is gonna be lab 32, Managing Incident Response Mitigation and Recovery. Okay, so on this one, it looks like we have a scenario here. Data security incident has occurred at 515 support. Of course, 515 support. CompTIA is premier uh, tech support company. You have been asked to contribute to the analysis and mitigation tasks. First, we'll create an image of one of the involved hard disks using the Lynx DD utility, okay? Next, we'll create a Windows group policy object to better control the applications that are allowed to run on Windows systems. And third, we'll configure Linux server to host centralized log files. And then we'll verify backup and restore processes on a Windows server. All right, great. DD, it's a pretty useful command. Normally, you'll be using something like autopsy or some piece of software that'll have some imaging uh, commands available, but DD can be used as a backup. And it's really, that stands for duplicate disk, DD, okay? So we're gonna open up a terminal and then we're gonna duplicate a disk here, okay? Let's see, oh, we're in root, okay. Let's see, uh, let's just make sure. Yeah, okay. So now we're going to be, we're going to run LB or LS BLK. It's going to list, list uh, statistics about our disk here. Use the output to record the name of the one gigabyte disk. One gigabyte disk, that's SDB. Okay. We have a couple of disks on here. That one's called SDB. So we're going to create a uh, copy of that, and it, it says it right here. So I don't know why we wait. Is this is this modular? Oh, it is. Interesting. Okay, that's pretty useful. So this one will change based on what we put in here. Okay, so we're going to do the DD command, and then we're going to have it's actually advanced command, so it's kind of useful. If equals slash dev slash sdb space of equals root slash victim dot img hmm Let me just double check this. If equals slash dev sdb of root, oh, I missed a slash. If you guys mistype things, just know that I always, almost always mistype things on the Linux labs. So don't, don't feel bad about it. <laughs> Sadie asks, can you do uh, pretty poorly on the PBQs in the exam and still pass? Unfortunately, no. Usually the PBQs are a significant chunk, and if you do poorly on them, you will probably won't pass, honestly. Uh, it helps to knock out and, and do really well on all the multiple choice, but the PBQs are usually weighted pretty heavily, and there's a lot of questions on there. So... You know, like one of those PBQs we just did had 12 different portions where you can be graded. So it, it really does matter to do well on the PBQs. Okay, anyway, we've done our DD here. We have created this uh, duplicate drive, essentially. So we've taken an image of the drive. And the reason why we're doing this in forensics, you want to capture the drive at the point of investigation. Okay, so you don't want to do your investigation directly on the target machine. What you want to do is you want to capture an image of that machine and then do all your forensics investigation on the image, okay? You have to preserve the target machine for chain of evidence purposes. That means you have to maintain, keep that machine intact so it could be admissible as evidence in a court of law if there is a criminal investigation or maybe a civil investigation 
uh, around the incident. Okay, so to prove to prove that to a court, you can't tamper with the machine. That's why we're making an image. Okay. Anyway, now we're going to create an MD5 hash. Uh, we need MD5 sum space victim dot img space carrot victim dash hash. So we've created a hash. Now you're not going to need to know this MD5 hash uh, command for, for the security plus exam. Probably for Linux plus you'll need to know it. Okay. All right. Simulate an accidental change to disk image file that would discredit it as evidence. Okay. Good question. Or that's pretty helpful. Now, oftentimes you'd create an image and then you create another image. You create an image at the time of, that you found the machine, then you create another image to do your work on. So you wouldn't work. You'd have one master image that you would just leave alone. All right, but we're going to modify that. Modify that image by saying investigation began date. Okay. Doing the echo command, we're going to modify this. Victim.img. Okay, now we're going to be doing the same MD5, MD5 sum victim.img, victim dash hash. Oh, crap. <laughs> I used a double dash there, or did I? Yeah, I used a double, <laughs> I should have used a double dash. So I've overwritten the initial hash. So, okay, we can do this a different way. I'm gonna, so what I've done here is we were supposed to check, you know, create another hash Basically, I created another hash after I made changes to the image. We were supposed to just check the hash instead. I'm going to do the echo command again, but I'm going to modify this slightly. So hopefully this will make this will work. If you guys are lost or you have any questions, please let me know. I know I'm going through this kind of fast. And then let's do this again, but let's do a double dash. Yeah. Okay. So now we have, now we've uh, found the hash files and I have two different hashes because I, I did it kind of incorrectly. <laughs> oh, well, it's not a big deal. Uh, I mean, this should be, well, we've recreated what we were supposed to do. So the file has changed. This is different. That's, that's really what that exercise was supposed to do there. Okay. All right. Let's go to the next step here. As a, as a response to the recent security incident, you have been asked to use group policy lockdown types of application. Okay, so we're going to DC1. So that's a pretty simple DD command uh, exercise there. And that's probably all you're gonna need to know. All you need to know for the exam is really that the DD command exists and that you use it to duplicate a disk image. P pretty much it. And basically so a little bit of the syntax, like you would use DD as the command. So just know that this command, you're not going to need to know the rest of this. Okay. Just need to know DD. That's why that exercise was so short. <clears throat> okay. Now we're going to be using server manager. We're going to create an organizational unit. Let's go to tools, active directory, users and computers. Create an OU named temps OU. Okay, so I guess in this scenario we're creating 
Yeah, temporary employee privileges. Which I'm not sure how this relates to incident response. And I think I selected that. It's just working here. So Active Directory uses computers. Okay, so I guess it's kind of working now. Active Directory uses computers, uh, tools, group policy management. Oh, we got to create the OU, right. Okay, so we're creating the OU called temps, okay? So we're going to go to go to users. Uh, we're going to create... No, no, we need organizational unit. Now, temps OU. Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. In Act Director uses computers, we're going to create an organizational unit called Temps OU. We're going to go ahead and create that. Okay. I think I want to create in the, the other... Should have created it up here. Okay, there we go. Temp so you. And then here we're gonna create a new group. New group called temps. And it's gonna be a global security group. Global scope security group. Okay, so now in the temp so you we have the temps security group. Got it. Okay, so now we can close this out. Now, unfortunately, I have another one here. So we're going to have to make sure that this... Actually, I could rename this. That'll work. Okay, there. <laughs> All right, now we won't get confused. All right, I close that out. And we go Tools, Group Policy Management. Group Policy Management. Now we're going to create a link to the no new group policy or uh, GPO to the temps OU. Okay, here's group policy management. All right, we have the temps OU. We're creating a new GPO. Okay, so we're creating a new GPO. Temp user configs. So we want to select temps OU, uh, create a GPO in this domain and link it here. Temps user configs. All right, temps user configs. Glad you guys are enjoying this. Brian, is that a question for me or is that a question for the chat? Uh, temp users configs. Okay, good. We want to edit this one, right? Okay. Now we're in the Temp users configs GPO browse to the computers, configurations, policies, Windows settings, security settings, application control, app locker. Goal for this year, my goal for this year is to get as many people certified as I can in as many certifications as possible. That is always my goal. So I want to exceed the number of students I trained last year, this year, and 
Yeah, if I'm getting people certified, I'm feeling good. That's that's my goal. And I think that's the best way I can help the cybersecurity community. Because we definitely need more people. Great question. Thanks for asking that. Um, all right, browse computer configuration policies. Policies. Windows settings. Security settings, application control policies. Okay. Application control policies. Application control policies. App locker. Got it. Okay, so we're setting up app locker. It could just say app locker. <laughs> it, I would prefer if it just said navigate to app locker and then it gives us this as like a drop down instead of having to read through that. But this is useful, I guess. Okay. Expand app locker node, right click Windows installer rules. Okay. I have to right click here on the node. Oh, there's another node here. Okay. This is a whole node. We got to... So really, this should go all the way down. Okay, right click on Windows Installer Rules. Create new rule. No, create default rules. Create default rules. Okay, there we go. Now we've created default rules. When you click, click Create Default Rules, Windows is going to automatically populate some default rules for you. Okay. And now we're going to modify these rules. I oh, know we're going to create a new rule on top of the default rules. Uh, it's going to say this is a wizard. We know that. We're going to pick deny. We're going to select the group temps. And you know, if you want to search here, you can hit check names to search. We've already selected temps, so 515 support slash temps. Go next, conditions, we pick path, okay. And we're gonna type in C lab file. So in here we have a, a uh, series of configuration settings pre-built for this lab. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and hit next there, exceptions, no exceptions, and we're gonna create that. We're gonna name it. Okay, we're gonna hit create. Repeat the steps above using the same values to create a rule blocking.exe files and slash lab files by being run by the temps group. Okay, so basically we created a rule to deny access to the lab files and now we're creating another rule to disallow running exe files from the lab files folder. Interesting. Deny, uh, I'm going to read some comments as I do this. You're going to be taking a Security Plus test soon. Well, I hope these videos help you. You know, that's what they're designed to do. So I appreciate it and good luck on your test. If you don't have a voucher yet, check out cybercrafttraining.com. We have discounted vouchers there. Don't pay full price for your voucher, please. Uh, definitely go and get a discounted voucher. And then what cert do I recommend after Security Plus? If you want to be a security analyst, I do recommend the, the CISA Plus. The CYSA Plus, CompTIA CYSA Plus, it's a really good one for cybersecurity analysts. It's designed for that role. So it's a great certification to get. Um, yeah, I definitely recommend that for cybersecurity analysts specifically. Great question, Brian. And it really, it draws a lot on this CompTIA Security Plus materials. So you're going to be familiar with a lot of these. If you like PBQs, you're going to get them on the CISA Plus too. And really, they want to say, CompTIA just told us, they, they want us to say, CYSA plus, not CISA, because there's also an ISACA CISA. Um, but that's a different, a different uh, certification. Okay.
how are we changing? How is this a different rule here? Repeat the steps above using the same values to create a rule blocking exe files and lamp files from being run by the temps group. I need to select temps here. That's the same rule. Okay, not sure about that one. All right, next we're gonna to go to configure rule enforcement. We're gonna select configure rule, uh, check the configured boxes, force rules for executable and Windows installer. We're going to apply that. All right, we had a Windows installer. Okay, we got to put it in the Windows executable uh, rules also. This is how we did it. Sorry. All right, so we have to create a new rule here. This is going to help us... Um, deny the .exe files. We're creating a different location. Same thing with path, lab files, no exceptions, create. I'm also gonna create the default rules. Okay, so now we've created, we've denied access to executable files for the temps and the same thing with installing. So you can't install anything, you can't run .exe files from the lab files folder. Okay, and then we're gonna set the application identity service to automatic startup. That should be, where is that? Okay, it's a whole different path here. So that's gonna be configure configuration, policies, Windows settings, security settings, yeah, application identity. Where is application identity? Anybody see this? Uh, doesn't SISA Plus also cover SEC Plus? Not really. No, it's different. I mean, it's a it's a more advanced certification, but it draws from some of the Security Plus material, but it's not like a replacement for it. I definitely recommend getting both. You don't want to just get SISA Plus without Security Plus. There's different. Uh, tool sets, skill sets that you're going to learn there. Not all the, the material on SISA Plus is really niche for analysts. Okay. Application identity, automatic startup. Where is this? Computer configuration, Windows settings. No. Yeah, policies, policies, window settings, security settings, application identity, account policies, local, event log, restricted, security services, hmm. System services, thank you. There we go. Thank you very much. Application identity, yep, there we go properties, define this property, and then we want to enable that, right? 
automatic. Okay. Thanks for that. <laughs> I'm floundering over here. This is one of those. This is why I like to do these lab videos because, you know, that's a key piece of information that's left off of here. If you don't know where to find it, you'll be sitting around wondering what's going on. Okay. So we've done enough group policy for the week. Let's <laughs> and then we're gonna go ahead and uh, right click on the temps temps users GPO. Okay. Let's see. Temps users config GPO. Save report. Save that to our desktop. Confirm that exists. It exists here. We could open that if we want. Take a look at all of the work we did. Good job. Email this to your boss. Uh, tell them. Tell them what a good job you did. Okay, great. All right. So basically, we created what we did there is we created a new group. We called that group temp. So we created a group for the temporary workers that would be coming on, and then we applied some specific controls for the temps. I wonder if we're going to be testing those controls. No, we're not. I mean, that'd be pretty cool. But we made it so that temps, temporary workers can't execute any .exe files in this folder and they can't, uh, I believe they couldn't access the folder too. They can't install anything from the folder. Okay. So pretty useful. All right. So now we're going to go back to doing Linux stuff. Configure a Linux server to host centralized log files. And this, this lab's all over the place. <laughs> all right, let's do this one. LX1. So we're going to LX1, CentOS. I'm going to log on. I appreciate the help there. Happy, thank you. That was helpful because it did not tell us where we need to go there. Okay, so we're going to open up terminal. You can just right click open terminal. I'm going to give myself root privileges. Remember when you type in the password, nothing's going to show up on the screen. So don't panic, just type in the password, hit enter. All right, so now we're going to use the visual editor. Vim slash in the etc the etc folder r syslog dot config. Okay, we have our Vim file opening. All right. You definitely want to know your Vim commands. Check out that Linux cheat sheet, cybercrafttraining.com. You'll learn all these commands. It really helps. Uh, did I type this incorrectly? No, I didn't. I did rsyslog slash config. Jeez. I'll tell you. <laughs> so if you feel bad about mistyping stuff, don't worry. I do it all the time. Like, wow, that's an interesting file to modify. There's nothing in there. <laughs> it's because there wasn't anything in there. <laughs> All right, rsyslog.config. Access denied. I'm a super user. What? Permission denied. Oh, I gotta type vim. Don't worry, <laughs> we'll get there. All right, so now we see a file that we can modify. Okay, and let's see, what is this? Okay, this is a log. Um, lots of stuff in here. Unfortunately, the search function rarely works with Vim, from my experience. So we're gonna modify some of these, some of these files here, okay?
Okay, uncomment the following two lines by selecting the hash or the hashtag and pressing X or the pounds. Let's see. Two lines enable the LX1 server source syslog service to accept inbound connection. Mod load and UDP server run. Okay, we gotta find these. There we go. Mod load. No, no. We need UDP. There we go. All right, great. That was pretty simple. All right. And then we hit X. I'm hitting the X key. That's all I'm doing. I'm just highlighting that and hitting X. Okay. And we need to navigate to the empty line just before global directives header. Okay. Not pretty simple. Enter the text on three separate lines. Oh, great. Here we go. Template. Oh, yeah. Got to go insert mode. And we're in insert mode now accidentally. Make sure to hit I for insert mode. Template, space, dynamic. Dynamic file, comma, parentheses, slash VAR, slash log, slash percent, host, host name, host name, percent, dot log. I think that's right. If you guys see me doing an error, let me know. Okay, so we hit enter. Then we go make a nice little face here. A surprise face. No, make a period, space, question mark, dynamic file. And then and. and the tilde key. Okay, now that should be correct. I'm glad I'm glad my mistakes help because <laughs> they're very real. <laughs> I try and do the PBQs on the fly to to do the to capture those mistakes and I try and do these labs without looking at them uh, or doing them for a while because, you know, I want you guys to realize that it's okay to make mistakes. Okay, so I just hit escape and then colon WQ to save my changes. I'm writing and I'm quitting, okay? So that's fine. Let's see. Okay, and it gives us, yeah, I think we did that right. It should be fine. So now we should restart it. System CTL, restart our syslog. Okay, great. All right, so now we're gonna configure the firewall to add inbound our syslog connections by entering the following commands. Okay, so now we're configuring a firewall. Firewall.cmd, double dash add. We're adding a rule port equals 514 slash UDP double dash permission or permanent creating a permanent rule there creating a rule for port 514 in the firewall success firewall dash CMD double dash reload Reloading the firewall to apply that rule and then we're gonna firewall firewall CMD is firewall command firewall command Double dash list dash all list all the rules Here we see ports 514 UDP. So that was correct. Great Okay, now we're gonna switch to Kali And we're gonna open up Vim I'm gonna do it on a new terminal window Vim slash etc slash r syslog 
dot config not slash config can't fool me and just c o n f not config that's right okay good we got it all right so we open that up uh great got to find the rules section and uncomment the first line there global directives Global directives always sounds very sinister to me. Global directives sounds like there's an order, like a shadow government controlling everything. Global directives. All right, rules. So we're gonna uncomment the line in the rules section, the first one. And let's see. Find the first uncommented line. So that's gonna be right here. And then we're going to create, we're going to add this text. Now you got to insert. And this is, this rule is going to be applied, or this thing is going to be applied first here. 10.1.0.10. To forward all messages through UDP to LX1. Okay, and 514 is going to tell us to do that. 10.1.0.10 is LX1's IP. 514 is the UDP port here. Escape LWQ. Good. Okay, that should work. Let's see if we did it. Yep. Okay, great. So we did that correctly. Good job. All right, configure forwarding. Yeah, we did that. Yep, that's exactly what we did. All right, restart the service log. Okay, that's uh, sys. Yeah, where is it? System CTL. Yeah, I forget the syntax a lot too. I don't really think there's a, you need to learn, know some syntax, but you don't need to know. Unless you're doing this stuff every day, I don't, I don't think there's a reason to fill your brain with needless memorization. That's why I try and give you guys the guides you need. You know, all the lessons I do, I try and teach you exactly what you need for the test because it's impossible to learn everything. I mean, you. The entire cybersecurity career is learning things and referencing things. Okay, so we restarted the rsyslog service. Run the logger command to generate a test message that reads tally, uh, tally text. Don't forget to use the exact same test. Text is specified in the instructions. Okay. Run the logger commands to generate a test message. Generate the message in the instructions. What is what is the message they want us to use? I don't get that. Uh, logger. Oh. Reads Cali test. Okay. Got it. Test. Okay. I think that should be right. That should be added automatically. Do I need to put a dollar sign in there? No, I think that's right. I don't know, we'll see. <laughs> I don't, I think logger should just be logger. The syntax should just be logger and then the command, right? I think so. So let's try LX1 here and see if we did that right. 
If we didn't, I'm not super concerned because that really doesn't have anything to do with this. I mean, all, all logger does is generate a command or generate a, a message in your in a log file or in any type of text file. Okay. Uh, you know, we're just signing in again and then we're going to change to the slash VAR slash log directory. All right, CD slash VAR, CD slash VAR slash log, okay. CD slash VAR slash log. Okay, so now we're in this slash VAR slash log file. All right, here we go. Run the ls command. Okay, ls. All right, here we go. ls command, display the contents of the VAR slash log directory. We should see a log file named Kali.log. I don't see that. I think I did need to go back and do that. Let's try this again. Let me try this. I'm not sure if I need a dollar sign. Nope. Hmm. It's kind of a curveball here. What? Restart the R syslog service and then generate Kali test. A log file entry exists. I'm not sure what I'm missing here. And I'm not sure if I really care. <laughs> Run the following command to display the test message on the central log server. Well, we don't have a Kali.log file to to cat, so it's not on there. I mean, that shouldn't score correctly. That should be incorrect. I think we missed one of these commands here. I'm not sure where we went astray. We did all of the, we did modify the rules here. We did that successfully. We restarted everything. We inputted these commands. I think this one just doesn't, the test message is what's tripping us up here. I'm gonna go move on. I'm not gonna trip up or stay on that one. I think we did we did most of the steps here and the point of this one, bear manages security instance will implement centralized log files for uh, Linux servers. We're gonna configure the LX1 as a central R syslog file storage server and then configure the virtual machine to forward its log files to LX1 VM. Now we did that, but I don't think the log file was forwarded correctly, possibly. And I think that's the step that's tripping us up. We do have the, the log file. Because we we configured the syslog. Anyway, let's move on. This isn't really that, this doesn't have too much to do with incident response. Remember, this whole thing was on incident response. And configuring log files very loosely relates to incident response. I mean, that would be... Anyway, now we're gonna go back up or store data on a Windows server. This lab, I think, is a catch-all lab. This is one of those labs where everything that they didn't fit in the other labs is put into this lab. I think this is the last lab we're doing, right? 
32, yeah. That's why these these really don't seem like they're they're connected at all. Okay, Windows Server backups. Now we're doing Windows Server's backup. I appreciate you joining in for the stream. Thanks for uh, joining in today. All right, so let's go ahead and do this. Server Manager Tools, Windows Server Backup. Tools, Windows Server Backup. Select Local Backup Node. Okay, select that Local Backup Node on the left. Okay, backup once, different options, custom backup. We're only gonna back up the, the lab files folder. So we're making a backup of that lab files folder and we're gonna store that Throw the backup job at the MS1 server. We're going to pick local drives, backup destination, no, remote shared folder, location. Really doesn't tell you how to do this, honestly. But we're going to put that location as this, the MS1 server. Uh, access control will hit as inherit. These are really bare bones instructions here. And we're going to go ahead and hit backup. It didn't tell us how to do most of that. So the backup's going to take three minutes to complete. Jeez. Okay. Okay, let's go ahead and uh, the next one's a comprehensive question. I don't really want to wait around for this. Let's see if we can skip ahead. Delete lab file sys internals from DC1. Okay, we can do that while we're waiting. No, this is DC1. So what we're gonna do next is we're gonna delete DC1, or we're gonna delete, not DC1. We're gonna delete the lab files folder and then we're gonna back it up from the remote server. So we're gonna back it up. Oh, it worked, okay, it didn't take three minutes. Lies, CompTIA, you've lied to me. Okay, so now we're gonna go ahead and the backup completed, right? Let's see. No, the backup failed. Why did the backup fail? Backup failed to complete. Is MS1 running? Should be. Let's go ahead and try that and let's try it again. Uh, let's try this one more time. Custom backup, add that lab files folder, see this lab files, okay. Next, select the remote. Should be remote shared folder. As a location, we'd select this. Oh wait, it's asking us not just to do lab files. It's asking us to do lab files sys internal. Okay. So we gotta add lab files sys internal. Right here, okay. I don't know if that's gonna make a difference. Mode shared folder, MS1 server, Inherent should be fine. Overwrite that backup and hit backup. Now let's see if this connects. <clears throat> it's deleting the old backup now. I 
we should be able to see this on the MS1 server. If we go to the MS1 server, navigate to the C drive. <clears throat> We see a Windows image backup, so it did work. It looks like it's working. Because this is the C drive of MS1, and that's where we're specifying that this goes to. But it says the data <clears throat> should work here in a moment, I hope. So essentially after this, what we're going to do is we're going to cover the folder from Windows Server Backup. This is going to take a while. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and do some of the comprehensive questions while this is working. Let's do some of these. Answer the following comprehensive questions to ensure you recognize the importance of the activity steps. Yeah, okay. Which of the following best describes why digital forensics experts works with copies of data during investigation? Anybody have any answer for this? We can just say one, two, three, or four. To prevent malware from affecting the investigator's workstation for efficiency, to ensure there are no changes to the original data that might make it inadmissible to in court or to gain administrative privileges. Which one of those? Yeah, this one's going to be, remember, to preserve chain of custody. And the one that relates mostly to that is this one here, to ensure no changes to the original data. All right, how does hash cryptography such as MD5, hold on. Since the backup failed to complete their failure, updating the backup for deleted items. Mounted backup volume is inaccessible. This one's just not working. Backup wants different options. Custom. Select the select the items. Lab files, sys internals. Got it. Okay. Store the backup job at this address. Remote shared folder. Location, type that in, and inherent access control. That should be fine. It's not working. It's just not working. Specified remote shared folder already has a back of this computer. Let's, jeez. Ah, I don't know. Let's try, let's go to MS1. Let's create a new folder in here. Uh, call it blue. Okay. Back to DC1. Let's put it in the blue folder. Now it sees the folders there. You see that? <clears throat> It sees all the folders in MS1, so it has some. It's connecting correctly. Let's try that. Maybe the the problem was deleting the folder or deleting the files. I think this is working. All right, let's go back to the comprehensive questions while that's working. Okay, how does hash cryptography such as MD5 sum utility help manage the data during the investigation? Does it increase performance? Is it proves the data hasn't changed unexpectedly or uh, proving um, proving data integrity. It guarantees data availability during the investigation or provides root or administrative privileges to the data. What do you guys think? One, two, three, or four.
And this one's gonna be helping prove uh, integrity or helping preserve integrity, proving the data hasn't changed. Remember we run a sum or a hash, we're gonna get a value of the data in its current state. And if the data changes, like we did in that scenario, then we're gonna get a different hash if we run that same hashing algorithm. Okay, so the disk completed, the backup worked now. So that was a workaround. So if, you know, going through the slab, that's a way to work around there, okay? Let's go back and finish out this lab here and then we'll do the last question. Okay, so in this one, we're gonna delete, we're on DC1, delete the lab files folder, or we'll delete the sys internals folder. Delete. Oh no, our data is lost. What are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? Now we're gonna go back to backup servers. We're gonna recover, okay? Uh, backup stored on another location. Remote shared folder. We're gonna type in that folder, and then we're gonna specify slash blue. Next, we're gonna select the date right now. We wanna recover files and folders. Uh, though, do we want to recover volumes? Except the remaining defaults, okay. And then we want to select the items to recover. Uh, recovery, specify recovery options. So like this PC, P, this PC, local disk, create a new folder named sysinternals recovered, okay? I could type that. Oh. Okay, great. Okay, so now what we're doing, we created a new folder called sysinternals recovered. We're going to take the, full, the files from MS1, recover them back to DC1. And we're gonna accept all the rest of the defaults. That should work. All right, let's do the last comprehensive question, or the last two. Which of the following answers best describes the advantage of centralized log files? Centralized log files are more efficient for servers to generate. Centralized log files are required on Linux systems. They're built into Active Directory, or log files are easier to search, parse, and archive. What do you guys think? Four. Yeah, great. Yeah, they're easier. When you have centralized logging, it's a lot easier to manage. You can use them for uh, threat analysis, discovering vulnerabilities. You can use some sort of um, auditing software. You can use something like Splunk and really gain visibility on your network. Okay, which of the following best describes security provided by backup or restore functions? Vulnerability scanning, availability, confidentiality, performance, or integrity? One, two, three, four, or five. It does look like our recovery process worked. So if we go into our C directory here, I know I'm jumping back and forth. We see all of our stuff that was recovered. That, that folder was populated. So great, that worked. All right, so this one's gonna be mostly for availability, right? All right, great job. All right, great job, guys. I hope that was helpful, and I appreciate you sticking with it. That was a long one, and that was one of those catch-all labs there.